will know as um, kind of the, um, as COVID was expanding, um, Robin and I began a conversation. Robin and I were in conversation about what would it look like if we were to bring together um, different disciplinary approaches, different divisions to come at this, to think about um, COVID-19 in different types of ways. So in many ways, um, the thinking of the time was as a liberal arts institution, we are in an optimal place to be able to bring together multiple disciplinaries, or multiple disciplines, excuse me, to be able to produce and help cultivate um, a dynamic, robust, multidisciplinary conversation, um, especially um, for our students and in the college more broadly. And again, I think we've been really happy um, with the results and the, the, the enthusiasm and excitement following the call. Um, yeah, I think that um, I will just echo what John said that um, we were really happy to see that people were interested in participating and um, finding ways to connect our classes at a time that we don't necessarily feel all that connected to each other. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists who've agreed to come um, and share a little bit about their courses. Um, I'm just going to go around um, in the order that I see them and ask them to introduce themselves and tell us um, what their role is at Center, and then just very briefly about their course. Um, what is this course and how does it engage with um, the pandemic? Uh, and so then after that, we can use that as a springboard for questions. Um, so let's start um, with Christina. Um, so I'm Christina Garcia, and I teach in the biology and the biochemistry and molecular biology programs. Um, and so the course that I am talking about coronavirus uh, is genetics uh, bio 210 introduction to genetics so it's um, a class for um, generally early students so first and second year actually more like second year students um, it's required for the major for both bio and BMB and um, also required for like med school and probably other pre-medical or pre-health um, programs. And so generally in um, this class, um, it's obviously a pre-existing class, and we talk about DNA, how DNA works, and then how genetic information flows at the molecular level. And then we switch gears a little bit and talk about inheritance. And so how different traits are inherited, you know, think about Mendel and some peas. That's kind of the other part of our, of our class. And so with, um, with COVID, one of the things that um, was really easy to, at least for me, to see a, a connection with was when we were talking about the like, um, like DNA world stuff. Um, and so thinking about how we um, can identify the virus. So we talked about how the PCR tests work. Um, the students went through the process of thinking about how to design a test to um, specifically test for the coronavirus, which I thought was exciting. I don't know if they thought it was that exciting. Um, and then we also talked about how um, we make vaccines. And so they also kind of went through the process of identifying a part of the virus that they wanted to use as a vaccine. And they you know, kind of talked about the different um, molecules that are needed in order for this um, vaccine to, to get produced inside, you know, like an industry lab or something like that. Um, and now that we're kind of in the more inheritance part of the um, term, we're talking about, um, I had them go into the primary literature and look up information about something that they're interested in. And so one of the things that we did on the first day of class was, you know, I asked them questions about you know, what do you know about COVID-19 and what do you want to learn? And so one of the things they wanted to learn was, you know, why are some people asymptomatic? Why are, do some people have really severe disease? And I, so I kind of challenged them and I said, let's go into the primary literature, find an article that relates in some way, shape or form. And then we will talk about inheritance patterns from that. And so that's kind of where we are 
um, in the class. We also had a discussion last week um, about prioritizing vaccines because um, that's kind of a, an issue that's coming up hopefully when we get a vaccine, uh, but then also how do we distribute it because we are kind of assuming that we're not going to have a lot of quantity of it. And so that was an interesting discussion um, that we had last week. So that's kind of the all of what we've been doing, <laughs> I think. Yeah, so that's really interesting how you've been able to um, incorporate some aspect into multiple units across the course, right? That's really neat. Um, so next in my um, view is Chris. Hey everyone, it's good to see you all. Um, I'm Chris Faulkner. I'm a second year visiting assistant professor in the International Studies program. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm trying out a microphone. So uh, yeah, good. I see some nodding heads. More than my students give sometimes. So I'm teaching IST 360. Um, it's a new course. It's global health, COVID in context. Um, I pitched this course out of sheer interest in what was happening last semester uh, as we we're all dealing with going online. And part of this stem from my, uh, my field's political science, and I'm interested in comparative politics and international relations. Uh, state capacity is a big thing in comparative politics and how states compete over uh, resources is a big concept in international relations. So I thought that it would be interesting to pitch this course um, framed through those two lenses, but then also because it's in the international studies program, trying to do something with a uh, historical perspective and an economics perspective. So that's kind of how I set the course up uh, where we we not just focused on COVID, we focused on the history of disease uh, from miasma to uh, germ theory and its evolution. Um, looking at cholera, looking at the plague, uh, looking at uh, various influenza uh, pandemics that have hit the international community, and then how governments have responded to these things over time, uh, and how we can draw conclusions from either uh, what's, what's worked and what hasn't worked from a uh, global health governance perspective. One aspect of this that's been kind of fundamental in my, my teaching has been international institutions and whether they work or not. In particular, the, the World Health Organization and how it's responded to things like Ebola in the past, how it's responded to, uh, let's see, the, some of the influenza pandemics that took place, the influenza swine flu in 2009 in particular, um, and then what it's done in, in COVID. And so, yeah, I, I kind of go all over the place in terms of my, my course. Uh, it's more breadth than depth, I'd say. Uh, but I think that the students have actually really enjoyed getting away from COVID at times, but also getting to see how disease has uh, been really impactful for state evolution, involvement, and uh, governance more generally. I'm happy to elaborate, but I'll pause there for now. No, I think that that's great. That sounds like a good stopping point. And we'll, once we hear about all of the classes, we'll be able to kind of dig into points of connection or um, answer people's questions in more depth. So thank you. Um, the next on my screen is Maria. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Maria Apostolova. I teach in economics and finance. And so I'm, um, I think, a little bit um, behind everyone else because I did not develop a new class. And it just so happens that current events are a big deal in an existing class that I teach. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about what the class uh, sort of used to be and then what it is now and it's really not very different but we have to spend really a lot of time thinking about how to incorporate what is happening with the economy into um, into what we're doing in the class so the class I teach is equity research and financial modeling so it's a it's an upper level um, finance like this so this class is about learning how to value the stock of a publicly traded company um, while realizing that the value, the intrinsic value of that stock is different, most likely than the price of that stock on the market today. And so learning methods, valuation methods for stocks is really what drives this class. We um, spend the entire semester um, learning these methods by applying 
them to a publicly traded company of the student's choice. So everybody is working on a different company. I'm working on a different company and sort of we learn everything as we go and we apply. So it's a very applied class. Um, and so one of the main um, drivers of the valuation process is a good forecast of the future financial results of the company. And so that involves a lot of digging and a lot of reading of previous financial statements, company press releases and things like that. And so naturally, it also involves looking at historical financial results and trying to use them to extrapolate right, um, the future ones. And so the problem that uh, we have to deal with is the fact that the first six months of the year have severely skewed the financial reports and results of basically every company out there. And then thinking about how to take this information and make a good forecast for year 2020 is pretty, you know, it's an involved process. And so that was one of the aspects of the class that has been affected by the pandemic. And another one is every class with a very short student presentation of a, a topic from just the recent finance news. And so not surprisingly, every topic that we talked about is related to the impact of the pandemic on economic agents, individuals, firms, governments, uh, the macro economy, and so on and so forth. And so we just, all of our current events discussions are about <laughs> the pandemic. So this is a, sort of a short overview of, um, yeah, how, how we're incorporating COVID in the class and I'm happy to um, talk more about the details. It sounds like it would be almost impossible not to incorporate COVID in the class. Exactly. Um, so it's, I'm glad that you seized that bull by the horns and, and took it on as a, as a focus. That's yeah, great. very easy, easy application. Easy application. <laughs> easy relationship. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Um, next on my screen is Caroline. Hi, my name is Caroline Manny, and I am the, a reference and instruction librarian for Division Two. And this is the first course, obviously, that I've taught here at Center because I've only been here for about a year and a half now. And um, the course that I taught was a new course. It's, it was um, given the number Humanities um, 222, and it's called Facts Matter, um, problem, Solving the Problem of Fake News in the COVID-19 Era. And so we've been looking, obviously, at fake news, um, alternate facts, misinformation, disinformation, whatever term you want to give to it, that's what we've been looking at. We started out looking at the history of fake news and seeing that it isn't, it isn't something that first started happening in 2016. Um, it's been happening since the beginning of time. and breaking it down into the different categories of misinformation, different disinformation, um, photo manipulations, information out of context, all sorts of um, different categories that, that we can identify. And then doing a, a root, because it's a problem solving class um, and its ultimate goal is to solve the problem of fake news, not a, not a small task there. Um, we did a root cause analysis of why does fake news happen? How does it happen? Um, how much does it happen? What's the significance of it? That sort of thing. And then we did a um, problem solving workshop to talk about strategies to solve problems. Did a little bit of research into the general categories of um, methods to solve the problem of fake news that have been applied in the past, such as um, an educational solution, a um, legislative regulatory solution, a system solution involving technology, um, because the part of the purpose of the class is to bring together different um, students in different disciplines and allow them to apply their particular um, skill set and knowledge set to this um, specific problem. And then the, the class concludes with the students um, working in groups to identify a particular aspect of fake news that they would like to solve 
um, choosing a solution method and then um, researching it and coming up with proposing an actual workable solution that, that and it, the stipulation is it has to be one that they can actually enact. Um, obviously, they're not going to have to, but they have to. It, this fabulous computer program unless they can actually do that. It's possible. And so ultimately the goal then of the class is um, to explore the ways that um, misinformation have um, eroded public trust and author in authority and science and to kind of consciously identify and be aware of our own cognitive biases and to develop the critical thinking skills to evaluate information for, for ourselves and to make sure that we're responsible producers and disseminators of information. Thanks, Those, that sounds like a really important topic and I look forward to students solving this problem. Um, right, they need, yeah. They need to get on it. <laughs> No, thank you. Um, so I've saved the best discipline for last, anthropology, um, and <laughs> I'll turn it over to Jamie. Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here and thanks for having me. Um, I am so disappointed that I have to follow such amazing discussions of classes that are going on, um, but I'm really impressed with all I've heard so far. So the class that I incorporated into the COVID Signature Series is SLJ210, Introduction to Social Justice. So that's a class that's been around for a few years now, um, but it sort of lended, it lended itself to interrogating what's going on at present with the pandemic. And so when I've talked about this before, I've, I've sort of described how basically the class looks at the ways in which COVID is exacerbating pre-pandemic realities, right? So these are things that have been going on for a very long time, and it just so happens that, that COVID provides yet another lens through which to understand them. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about a bit about the class, but I think it's one of those things where I know CTL has sort of been asking us to think about things that we would carry forward um, from this sort of crazy discovering things that work better. And I think this is something that actually works a lot better for me that I have a case study that I carry through once per week. And so basically throughout the entire block, we are applying things that we learned from the first week to COVID over and over and over again, um, using also slightly different lenses tailored to the particular ism that we're looking at. But I find that it has helped with retention immensely. So it's been, it's been an awesome experience. Um, so in general, the class talks about uh, theoretical foundations of social justice studies. So probably things that they've at least heard about, like diversity, intersectionality, equity, so words that get tossed around quite a bit. We actually define them. And then we move on to things like systems of oppression and the cycle of so socialization. And finally, we move sort of a, a deeper understanding of, of um, social justice theoretical foundations through anti-ism. So I'm sure many of you have heard of anti-racism. Um, and then we move into liberation. So discussions of, of what it would actually mean to, to move into a cycle of liberation. Um, so as I mentioned before, each week we use the analytical lenses that we've developed to consider COVID. So we started with racism, so structural racism as it relates to COVID. Then we moved to ableism, classism, sexism, and now we're in heterosexism and trans oppression. And so essentially any social justice issue that you can think of, um, there is a COVID situation for that. And so um, I have specific mechanism, or mechanisms that I've been using to analyze COVID. So techniques that I found really helpful in terms of um, how to use Moodle and how to use class time to reflect on what goes on Moodle. I don't know if, if I don't think now is the time to talk about that. And so I'll probably just leave it there. But if anybody would like to talk about, hey, I have my class is coming up and I, on a weekly basis, I'm gonna be considered, considering COVID on one day. How do I do it? I'm happy to talk about how it works for me. 
Thank you so much. That yeah, that's really interesting. Getting into the actual kind of the how the setup of Moodle um, and the course um, relates to taking on this kind of case study. Um, so that's a lot to think about. Um, a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different approaches. And one of the things that I appreciate is um, that there's a mix of courses that are totally new, totally just created for this context, and then courses that already existed that either because it was inescapable or because you chose to use COVID as a lens, um, you have kind of refigured these existing courses. Um, and so I'd like to open it up to questions from the, um, the group. I feel like I'm more interested in hearing answers to uh, the questions that you all have, although I do have some questions in my back pocket. So feel free to use the chat and I'll act as moderator or to raise your hand um, and I can call on you. Um, John, I see you're unmuted. It looks like you might have a question. Yeah, um, I had a question for Christina. Um, you had said that at the beginning of the course, you asked your students, what do you know and what do you want to know? I'm curious if from that question, when you designed the course, did you intentionally create um, open space um, or blocks of time to um, allocate for flexibility? Or are these questions that you have simply tried to address along the way? They're questions that I tried to address along the way. I, you know, I think from, from my perspective, I could at least um, imagine some of what their questions would have been. Um, and I, and in my head when I was designing or redesigning the course, um, you know, I, I kind of figured, okay, you know, perhaps one of the things that they say in that what do you want to know is something we can plug into the inheritance section of the of the course because I hadn't really you know for that part you know I was just going to make something up um, but turns out they had questions so <laughs> that that seemed to be pertinent um, so that's that's really where that kind of fit in and then um, you know but some of them like you know were saying why is it taking so long to make a vaccine um, and then had to explain to them that it usually takes like 15 years to make a vaccine. And then, uh, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, and then like going, you know, through the process of thinking about this is how a vaccine works. This is how we can make a vaccine. Um, those were the sorts of things that I knew that I wanted to do already. That's kind of an interesting question maybe for other panelists too. How have you balanced sort of what students want to know or, or student inquiry driving the course um, versus what you already knew that you wanted to cover or the ways that you already knew that you wanted to integrate COVID into your class? Chris? I, I surveyed my, kind of going off John's question, I surveyed my students beforehand so this is a luxury of having a little bit of time to plan over the summer um, and kind of just gauge their interest in what they wanted to know about COVID. Being a new course, started from a fresh slate, and I had a lot of students interested in uh, health outcomes based off uh, race or socioeconomic status. So we have a few class periods that are devoted to these questions of social justice um, and social inequalities. I had a lot of students interested in data and interpretation of data. So we had uh, a lesson on what we can and can't derive from information that the CDC might put out, um, information that's being aggregated by uh, Johns Hopkins and other uh, COVID tracking resources. Um, and then we had a lot of students interested in uh, how COVID impacts prisons or jails. Um, and so that actually, we haven't got to that one yet, but that will be one of the uh, final two days of the semester. We're actually focusing exclusively on uh, these populations that sometimes get lost in the mix when we consider how the pandemic's influencing them. Thanks. Any other panelists want to, yeah, Caroline? The course that I'm teaching on fake news, I've actually taught before in different contexts. Like for example, um, when climate change first became a hot topic and during the 2016 presidential election. So there was kind of a, a set of information that we needed to know about fake news and how it's created and how, how it impacts um, society and whatnot. But then being able to put it in the context of fake news, like Chris, I was, um, had the benefit of being able to kind of do a survey with the students um, before class started. 
and the first day of the course was actually a workshop um, that I frankly completely stole from um, the Disney Institute, which I used to attend when I was in Florida, the um, Disney Creative Institute. And it's a creative problem solving workshop. And in, during the first two days of class when we did that workshop, they had the opportunity to do some preliminary exploration, a um, little bit of preliminary research, exploratory research, identify topics that might be interesting to them, directions that they wanted to go. And so between what we surveyed before class started and by the end of those two days of the, of the first workshop, they really had been able to identify what they wanted to do. And then every day in class, we had a jigsaw discussion and it was their responsibility to bring their interest and their personal research on their interest into the class on a given topic. So in that way, they could really control the way that the, um, the, the daily content of the course. And I think that they really enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you. That sounds very student driven. Uh, Lori. Yeah, I have a question on how to balance planning with the pace of current events. You know, you could, you plan the class and you plan to cover certain topics and then current events like take this sharp turn and I'm wondering how, how you all manage that. That's a concern that I have. <laughs> well, as you get ready to teach a coronavirus signature series course in block two, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And we don't really have time to survey the students. Also, uh, I mean, that's a different topic, but I'm really concerned about that planning versus current events kind of hijacking your plans, even though I know pedagogically that's a good thing, but <laughs> It does. Someone work. who likes structure, I hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what are your thoughts or experiences on this, panelists? Jamie, do you want to kick us off? So, yeah. Um, I think this is a good opportunity to kind of bring in what I mentioned earlier. Um, so, I'm not. I like to say that I'm flexible, but yeah, I do like to plan ahead. Um, so, so in order to deal with the the fact that so much on COVID, even as it relates to, to social justice, becomes outdated pretty quickly. Um, I built in days that I call BYOCC days, so bring your own COVID case study. Um, and it's clunky, but now everybody calls it the BYOCC and we just are on the same page. Um, so for that day, I gave them a couple of readings uh, to, to kind of ground them in why COVID relates to whatever structural ism that we're looking at. So structural racism or whatever. So there are a couple of things that I identified when I made the syllabus. And so by, by now they're even outdated, right? And so, you know, they look at them and they read them and sometimes they're like, wow, we've already moved on from this, but it's okay. We've still kind of established uh, something to which they can apply the issues that we're talking about in class. So these lenses that I talk about and actually what I, I have them do, and this is going to sound super complicated, but just bear with me, is for each of those BYOCC days, I have um, five to six annotators who have used hypothesis or whatever collaborative annotation software you're comfortable with to annotate the readings that I've assigned for that day. So then they do the, the they're, they come to class prepared to kind of talk about those and they also annotate them so that everybody in class benefits from their annotations. I summarize their annotations and use it to make questions. And so I come to class with a list of questions. And then the BYOCCs are for everybody else. So those people who aren't annotating, they're bringing a case study that is in the now, right? So it's something that has been published even more recently than what I have assigned. It's typically a news story, but it can be a piece of art, it can be a video, it can be whatever. And so I have them put that on Moodle, so it creates basically a current database of whatever exists on that element of, of COVID as it relates to social justice. And then so when we come to class, we start class with a discussion of the questions. I send them into breakout rooms, so they, they go discuss, and then we have a big group when we come back. And then we end class, and I send the students to Moodle, and they have to go to the BYOCCs for that day and, and pick through them. And then I give them a small project to do at the end of class, like write a postcard. Today was write a postcard to the mayor of some town, and in using evidence from So, so all of that is to say that 
Um, you can build in that flexibility by you know, having something that will maybe frame the discussion for the day, but then letting students build a database from which they pull actively in class and like group work or something. That's so interesting, Jamie, and I feel like that's also a way to manage, you know, kind of an onslaught of information, right? Like it's happening now and there's so much. Um, and so it's hard to, for you to curate, but you're kind of asking students to curate in kind of a structured way. Um, so that's great. Maria, I see you have your, um, yourself unmuted. Yes, that's the new uh, raising of your hand, right, to say you want to participate. So um, yeah, mine is much uh, simpler than this, I'm afraid. And I, I mentioned it already earlier. Um, so I build time for these um, finance stories is what we call them. And so inevitably, they basically cover all of the very current, <laughs> very current events because students, I mean, they're naturally interested in this. And so every class starts with what happened this morning, right? That, that's generally what they pick. And um, what we do is very informal. We um, spend about 15 minutes talking about that particular news story. Um, I ask the student who presents to uh, prepare two questions for the rest of the class that um, can help us to start the discussion. And then they continue that discussion on Moodle in a blog um, where they uh, continue to contribute um, to the conversation after class. And so that's my way of, of uh, handling this. It's not um, the depth I think is lacking with this format, but um, at least the breadth is there and, and every student gets the chance to uh, bring up something that um, occurred. I can mention what I do as well for the current event stuff. Um, I've kind of buffered in Mondays is a day where they don't have any readings. They have an assignment due every Sunday for consistency um, since it is so accelerated and they have the entire week to work on that uh, project. It's related to a, a country that they're becoming an expert on in terms of the COVID response, in terms of how their healthcare system works. Um, and then a current event or issue surrounding COVID, whether it's through an economic, social justice or uh, historical lens, or not historical, um, security lens, excuse me. And so on Mondays, they present, uh, four people present on their respective uh, assignment from the previous week. And I use that time as, I know the, the cases that are coming up. And so I draw current events about COVID uh, in those respective regions as the conversation to drive the discussion after. Um, so it gives them uh, a little bit more depth on the respective case that somebody was presenting on in the context of the coronavirus. Uh, so we can talk about current events in that format on Mondays and use that for driving discussion for the rest of the week if they want to follow up on it. Um, and it seemed to work out pretty well. Um, that I normally start class with what's happening in the world when it comes to COVID, just to see if anyone's reading the news. Uh, and we spend, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes talking about what somebody brings up. Um, but I haven't found it to be too much of an issue. No. So, so it's, well, the commonality that I hear is that people are kind of building in um, within their structure, they're building in space for new things to happen. Um, so they don't need to alter the structure if new things happen, but that, that they can bring those new things in. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, anybody have a, a, another question to add? I don't see anybody, so I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna jump in and ask about your students. Um, so it, how, what, what, how are your students reacting to this focus or responding to this focus on COVID? Um, I can imagine um, a scenario where students are really excited to like actually be able to explain to their peers what um, PCR means. Everybody's talking about that you ought to get the PCR test, but but they can they know what that means. Um, that might feel empowering, but then I can also imagine kind of a mental exhaustion of, of thinking about this all the time um, when it's also affecting so many other parts of their lives. So I'm curious to hear if you have any sense of how your students are are responding to your focus. I'll jump in. Thank you, Jamie. Um, sure. No, I, I have to say I've, I haven't really had, I actually feared that, right? I was worried that it would be just 
um, too much on top of everything else that that's going on for them to just revisit this. But you know, it has not really shown itself to be too burdensome. We only do do once a week where we totally dedicate ourselves to to COVID. So maybe that helps a little bit. Um, and you know, I have had students tell me that they have had family members come down with COVID during the class, and I think more than more than anything, um, we built a lot of community this term. So it's more of like they know that it's a supportive environment, and and so what we've learned in class is, is helping them process um, that, and and also understand it if if it's um, if they find if they can see themselves reflected in the material that we're covering right so if if they happen to come from a, a group that we've been talking about in class or, or feel marginalized in some experiencing in a new way and it, and it helps them um, so you know I think it's been overall positive in ways that I, I was worried about and, and my worries were unfounded great that's really good to hear Caroline, I'll jump. I'll jump off that. Um, my my class, on the other hand, is pretty much completely focused on COVID every day because that's the context of fake news. And I think that um, what Jamie said about how everybody is kind—I was worried also that either people would be bored with this as a topic, or overwhelmed with it as a topic, or any other range of emotional um, responses. But the one that I've seen most in my class is because everyone is actually experiencing this, this is directly part of their lives. In this class, they are more engaged with the concept that fake news actually happens and more outraged by it and more concerned with it and more interested in trying to solve the problem than in like when I taught the class as a 2016 election issue. Sure, they were interested in voting for the first time, but, you know, and with the climate change class when I taught it that way, they were interested in the climate, but this is something that they're directly seeing in their lives and they're directly seeing how their family members are impacted by fake news or misinformation and, and that sort of thing. And so they're really engaged with the class because of that. And it's been really exciting to, to see them get outraged. <laughs> yeah, that, I can see that, um, that they feel that it's real, right, um, in ways that are probably really useful for teaching the subject. I don't know if there was another panelist who was going to respond. Okay. Um, Christian. Yeah, so um, and hi everyone. Thank you panelists. Uh, all of you are super impressive, um, not just for the reason that I'll be teaching my own version of a COVID course, but this has been one of the best uh, afternoons I've spent in a long time. Um, my question is, uh, it's some kind of parallel or corollary to what Robin asked, but it kind of flips the telescope. Um, as teachers, as professors of your courses, have there been moments where you've gotten too close to COVID? where you felt like this is too much in that lens, right? In that frame. Uh, and if so, is there any kind of advice you might want to give to someone who's going to, you know, take that, that trip uh, in, in two weeks? That's a, a great question. Uh, Christina. Yeah, I mean, I, I will speak a little bit to that. I, you know, I guess I should preface this by also saying that um, actually I started out I started my class in the spring by talking about this new epidemic that was happening in China, because um, that was back in February and, you know, things were happening and, you know, and it, it really directly applied to the things that I was talking about, like DNA and RNA and all that stuff. Um, and so I kind of had the, like, the idea, like, I mean, like, I kind of did a little um, dry run of what I'm doing now in the spring. And so it's kind of like, I've been thinking about it since the spring. Um, and I've been doing it since the spring. And I think, like, honestly, I, I'm not able to read my class. Like, I can't tell whether they're like sick and tired of COVID or if they're just tired. Um, Cause they're all tired <laughs> like right now. And they come in and like, I see how tired they are. And I'm just like, I, I don't know how to. Help. 
having those little breaks, kind of like what Jamie was mentioning, would probably be good at least. Like, you know, I know that I we didn't start, I mean, we, we started on the first day, I said, what do you want to know and what do you already know? But then we talked about cancer for a couple days. And then um, when we wrap up, um, when we wrap up next week, we're, we're not gonna be really focusing on, on COVID. We're gonna be focusing probably on cancer again, cause that's just what I study. Um, so, you know, taking a break from it and I think taking a step back is, is also good. Um, you know, in, in terms of, you know, just like for me and for the, for the class, like, you know, I'm really asking them to apply a lot of the knowledge that normally um, in a normal term, really, I would be making them memorize and take an exam. But because of the way that I'm teaching, I'm not actually having sit down timed exams. And so they kind of have to do this group project where they apply the content to kind of this new scenario. Um, so I think it's been making them think in different ways that they're perhaps not used to, especially as science people where they tend to have to memorize a lot of stuff. Um, so I, I think the break might be a little bit, I think it'll be good for them just to help them a little bit, like take a step back and maybe synthesize some of the things that we've been talking about. Thank you so much, Maria. Uh, yeah, so uh, what I have found, at least for me, and I think also maybe for the students when I talk to them one on one, is that once we started focusing on building this five year forecast where we went beyond, you know, the current fiscal year and how difficult it's going to be to forecast this because of everything that's going on. And then, hey, look, in two years, things will be normal. Again. it's gonna be okay <laughs> at some point in the future. I think that that um, certainly helps me um, sort of not be sick and tired of this. Um, although, yeah, that's how I feel most of the time. So yeah, just, yeah, the future is bright <laughs> is what I like to tell myself and the students. Good to know that financial models are, are telling us that that's hopeful. Well, we, we make them, Robin, so, you know, they can tell us whatever we want. <laughs> so We're only as good as the data that we have in the yeah, assumptions, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to build in this optimism and then all will be well. Excellent. Excellent. I look forward to it. Um, Jamie, did you unmute? Do you want to add something? To the yeah, just quickly to, to Christian's question. I think, I don't know that I've had a situation where personally I felt like, like COVID has, like the, the class has has affected me deeply because of a personal experience that I've had with COVID. But I will say that um, it is harder when you're teaching about it and, and students are worried about it and their families are being affected. So I would say that probably the thing to, to think about, at least personally, like how would you deal with it would be if someone sent me an email about, you know, I'm, I'm not doing well because my family is being affected and I can't complete my assignments, then um, have a plan because that is something that it does reflect on you a little bit more um, as an instructor if you're teaching about all of the the issues associated with COVID, especially since they cannot be really separated from issues of equity, um, and then having students who are really struggling as a result of it as well. Yeah, that's a that's a great um, reminder to kind of yeah to think through um, your response as part of teaching the course. Um, so we're nearing the end. I don't know if, a, if um, anybody else wants to jump in on the question of um, maybe how it's how teaching and being close to the pandemic is affecting you as a teacher. Um, so maybe that kind of as a final question. And then also if any panelist wants to add anything that um, that they've learned or a way that your thinking has been changed um, about the pandemic or about something else by teaching this course. Um, I can maybe weigh in on what Christian asked about uh, how the pandemic's affected me individually, but how I've seen it play out with the students and things that I think have been useful. Uh, first and foremost, I'm not a global health practitioner. Like, it's not what I studied. And so, first, it was really exciting to get the opportunity to develop a course on this, just because it was of interest. The caveat to that is reading about infectious disease all day, every day, whether it's uh, COVID or malaria or Ebola or something else has been uh, depressing. 
uh, to say the least. But arming my students with information and then giving them some access to people that work in this field. I was fortunate enough to have someone from the CDC speak to them about the challenges that they've encountered. I had the director for uh, public health of Boyle County speak about collaboration with center and reopening and what they've observed in their role uh, to combat COVID and or to reopen uh, institutions like center or our uh, schools in Kentucky. And so that's been a really useful experience where you can talk about the planning and the policies and the creative ways in which we can respond to coronavirus and use case studies to do it. But uh, it goes off what Maria was saying, thinking about creativity in the future uh, has been kind of a nice adjustment from just how to combat what we're dealing with currently. Thank you. Any other final thoughts from any of the panelists, Caroline? I'll have to say, and uh, some of you have heard me say this before, as I mentioned, I taught this class in other places. What's really impressed me here at Center, so I've considered this question and the question of, you know, methods to solve um, the problem of disinformation in numerous different contexts. And I've just been so impressed with the ideas that the students had here and how actually unique they are. I mean, some of the stuff that, that the students are going to turn in for their final paper is probably publishable. I, it's stuff that I haven't seen other places. And I've, I've just been so pleased and impressed with, with their depth of thought on, on the subject. So I, I'm just really happy. I've, I'm made happy by that if I get to um, focused on, on COVID-19. I'm made very happy by the depth of their thought. Yeah, and, and I think, oh, go ahead, Christina. Oh, I mean, you can go ahead. I was just gonna. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say that one of the things that just always impresses me about our students is that if you set them a challenge, um, they will often rise to it. And this is certainly a challenge, right? It's, it's a thorny problem. And so it's, cool to, to know that they're rising to that challenge in, in the context of your class. Christina. Yeah, I was, uh -huh. I was just going to build off of what Caroline was saying that, um, you know, as somebody in the, um, the, like, you know, sciences, and we, you know, tend to focus on like biology, and this is how a virus works, and um, all that kind of stuff. Um, I've been really pleased because we've, or at least I've had some like asynchronous discussions with the class or they've had asynchronous discussions among themselves. Um, and, and I've just always been really impressed like whenever they can bring in something that they learned in another class and they can relate it to what we're talking about. Um, and so that's, that's really just impressed me and, and it kind of, you know, makes me realize how like well-rounded they are overall, which is really, really pleasing. Um, and so, you know, with our discussion about vaccinations and prioritization, they were, you know, like one student brought up, um, you know, well, what about people who don't have health insurance? How are we gonna prioritize them? And where do they fall in this tiered system of, um, you know, vaccinations and, and that kind of stuff. And then somebody brought in um, the, um, convo about the refugee crisis and talking about how refugees were um, being did um, because of their conditions and their living conditions. And so I'm just really pleased by, by all of that and very heartened, I guess, about the future um, because they are thinking about these bigger issues. No, that's excellent. Um, I think that it, to bring it back to um, the conversations that John and I had at the beginning of this, I think, you know, this is a moment uh, where there's higher education is facing a lot of challenges. And, you know, one of the ways that we were thinking about this is a way to show that liberal arts, you know, and these interdisciplinary connections and these different perspectives that we have on these complicated problems, um, you know, has some tools that are really valuable in a moment of challenge and, and crisis. And, and I, I feel like your stories about your teaching um, and students are really, uh, really reflecting that. 
Um, so that feels like a suitably um, broad and, and profound and positive place um, to end for today. Um, so I really appreciate the panelists taking time to be experts in their, their courses and their teaching and sharing with us what they're doing. And I really appreciate all of you um, taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us. And I hope that you all have a good evening. Thank you so much. Thanks, Robin. This was really great. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate it. And your class sounds like it's a wonderful one. All of you all. Please. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this. This was really neat to hear everybody else's perspectives and whatnot. Totally <laughs> agree. Yeah. I'll be reaching out to a few of you because I need I need some ideas. I learned a lot, so. <laughs> no, I know. I feel like, you know, there's the whole other level of just the teaching techniques that you all are using um, in addition to the, the subject material were, were also exactly. really fascinating to learn about. Yes, yes I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much.